Hello? Okay. Yeah, all right. Okay. I should turn off my... So can you hear me online? Yes, we do. Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, people can hear me. I don't think here. Can you hear us? They can hear me. I mean, you want to use my mic. Uh, welcome, everyone. How was your meta economic matter? Tom stated the projector is broke, uh, and so we are using this uh, common one to the seminar, but it can be more revised. So please feel free to win back that equipment. So today we are very honored to have a present to be a subject. You'll be speaking about models and cookery from the local level. Thank you. <laughs> are, are you going to record this? Or? It's recording? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Duvin. <laughs> uh, it's good to be here. And uh, yeah, please feel free to interrupt with questions. Uh, also, people here or people online. I guess this is supposed to be about 90 minutes. So I I think it's slow. No, 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 90 minutes. <laughs> so I will, uh, hopefully I'll finish much shorter than that. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about recent and not so recent work on the cube rates. Uh, and let me begin by uh, acknowledging some of the collaborators. So that the work I'm fo focusing on is on, on these two papers uh, that are listed down here, very recent papers. And uh, collaborators here, Main Christos and Yushi Wo, Henry Shackleton, Matthias Scheuer, who's in Austria, Yahoo Zhang at Johns Hopkins, uh, Alex Nikolenko, and Darshan Joshi now in TIFR Hyderabad, and Jonas Mon uh, Belchuski, I guess uh, he's in Munich. All right, so here's the uh, a very famous phase diagram of the cube rates. Uh, where as a function of temperature and doping, you have a, a lot of complexity. Uh, and you know we've been working very hard to understand the relationship of all these phases that you see in this famous phase diagram. Of course, most important is this critical temperature for superconductivity, uh, which can be up to 100 or more Kelvin. Uh, but then uh, the interest, you know, we understand the basics of the superconducting state pretty well. The interest is really on everything else in this phase diagram at this point. Uh, so at very low doping, you have long range antiferromagnetic order, which is completely commensurate. Uh, and then uh, uh, at higher temperature, there's a strange metal, which I won't be talking about. But my focus here today will be on the pseudo gap phase. I'll uh, talk about some of its properties shortly. Uh, and then as you lower temperature from the pseudo gap, uh, you get superconductivity, but also in some compounds or in high magnetic fields. Uh, you get some sort of charge density wave order. Okay. All right. So, so that's the, the global picture. So let's start with the phase that's well understood. Uh, at high doping, you have the Fermi liquid. Uh, in this case, you have a Fermi surface. Uh, and the volume enclosed by this Fermi surface uh, is exactly right. It would be exactly the volume of compute if you were just dealing with free electrons. There's some messages on chat. Okay, yeah, everything's fine. Um, okay. Uh, all right, so so that's that's good. Now, usually when we do a theory of superconductors or any other ordered phases in, in condensed matter physics, 
we start from the Fermi liquid and then look at it for its various instability. Subir, the people online cannot hear you. Maybe I just use my ordinary mic. Yes. <laughs> Okay, I'll just use my mic. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So when did I stop? When did you stop hearing me now? Uh, ten oh seven. Previous slide, which is all right. So let me just quickly say what I just said about this phase diagram. Uh, so the Fermi liquid instability to Superconductivity and charge density about is well understood, but we want to understand the instability of the pseudo gap with this Fermi arc spectra to charge density wave and superconductivity. And also, one of the big questions, natural questions, would be why the TC onset or the TC actual are about the same, uh, whereas in Fermi liquid theory, they are really very different numbers in general. Okay. Uh, then this. <clears throat> The charge ordered phase, I said it's conventional. Well, it's conventional in the sense that it's some kind of charge density wave. But if you try to understand the fermionic spectrum in the charge ordered phase uh, from an instability to a Fermi liquid, that you start from a Fermi liquid and then you put in a charge density wave order and you look at the Fermi surfaces, uh, that doesn't do a very good job. And uh, you, know, you can't really explain uh, what you actually see in quantum oscillation and thermodynamic measurements at these low temperatures. So that's another important question uh, that we would like to address. Okay. All right, so, so that's a list of some of the open questions that uh, I'm going to partially try to address. Uh, so it all begins with the theory of the pseudo gap. Uh, you know, first we need a theory of the pseudo gap and then we can ask about what happened at lower temperatures. Uh, so that you know, uh, so we do have a proposed for a theory, uh, which was developed in various papers, uh, especially in work early on with Yahoo Zhang, uh, and uh, and the bottom line for that theory uh, is the following: uh, that these Fermi arcs are really remnants of an actual Fermi surface, uh, whose intensity in photoemission at the backside is very low. Uh, and if you now take, if you now believe there really are Fermi surfaces of electrons present here, uh, then you have a problem because the volume enclosed by this Fermi surfaces uh, does not obey the Luttinger relation. That is not the same volume you get for free electrons. 
so you're violating a very fundamental relation. Um, and there's this idea that we sometimes call FL star that you can violate the legendary relation provided there's a spin liquid around. Uh, and so underlying this Fermi arc spectrum must be a spin liquid. And that spin liquid really will be the central actor in everything I'm going to talk about. So I don't want to, I will say a little bit more about this ancilla theory, but let me begin by just, since I don't want to get, that's you know not the main focus of this talk. Uh, let me just give you a very simple a crude picture of what we think is going on in this sort of gap, just in terms of just some simple pictures. Uh, okay. So let's start with the antiferromagnet and we put in some holes. So, uh, and now of course we know that once you put in 5% of holes, uh, the antiferromagnetism disappears. So we can make it disappear by having the spins form singlets with each other. Uh, and now they can be, you know, so this, you have some singlets and these singlets can resonate with each other. Uh, and so that's the spin liquid part, if you wish. Uh, and then the holes can also move. So this is a charge E object uh, carrying no spin. And so it's sometimes called a holon. And so one uh, thought would be, well, these holons are fermions and they form a Fermi surface and there's your dope pseudo gap state. Except that doesn't work really because these holons don't carry spin. Uh, whereas there's, I think, significant evidence that the uh, the Fermi arcs are really associated with spinful quasi particles. So that can't be the story. Uh, although there was a story in the early days of the cube rates. Uh, but now let's look at the spin excitations. So now the spin excitations naively in this spin liquid are spin a half spin ons, which carry spin but no charge. Okay, that's a excitation. But now imagine that uh, these spin ons and hole ons, as they're moving in the background of the spin liquid, happen to be near each other. And, and now because of this, there's some attractive force between them. So maybe they form a bound state, which I represent by this green dimer. So this green dimer is, is really a spin and a hole or a hole on resonating this way. And there's some energy gained by that. In fact, the energy gained is quite large because it's the hopping matrix element T, uh, not J, which is controlling everything else. Uh, and uh, so maybe this bound state forms, and in this simple picture, the bound state is just a dimer. Well, that's a very uh, crude ansatz, but anyway, maybe that's what it is. And now if I look at this green object, uh, it has all the quantum numbers of an electron. It has charge E and a spin a half. So it's just an electron. It's some wrongly normalized electron. But of course, the big difference is this the density of these electrons is not the density of all the electrons, it's the density P, it's just the dopant density, the density of the holons, uh, because each holon captures a spin on. And so now we have a picture of the pseudo of the pseudo gap metal, sorry, uh, which is this resonating uh, green dimers and blue dimers. <laughs> so that and these green dimers then form a Fermi surface. All right, so that's the you know. Uh, the kindergarten picture. Uh, and we, of course, later on, I'll try to talk about more sophisticated versions of this, which you can actually put for numbers. But anyway, the thing to notice now uh, is that if you look at this picture in a colorblind way, uh, you don't see any difference from a spin liquid. So, so that's really the point. There's a spin liquid, which is as if it's in an insulator. It's uh, the whole structure of the spin liquid is just as in the insulator. And on top of it, there are these charges, electron-like objects moving around the green objects, um, which give you the Fermi surface. All right, so that's the simple crude picture of the pseudo gap metal. All right, so now I have all the preliminaries out of the way. So, and you have at least some idea of what the pseudo gap metal is, at least in this uh, analysis. And so now we're going to try to lower the temperature and ask what happens. So here the basic picture will be, there is underlying the pseudo gap, a fractionalized state. There is this spin liquid, which has these spin a half charge zero excitation. It has spin ons. Uh, and, but as we lower the temperatures, these fractionalized excitations must confine. So there's some gauge theory that describes the spin ons. Uh, and this 
uh, theory must confine. And so now the onset of these conventional state at low temperature is really a confinement crossover from some fractionalized state at higher temperatures to a confining state at low temperature. And that, if you wish, is the replacement for what we usually do, uh, where we start from a Fermi liquid and then have some Cooper pair or CDW or various instabilities. Here we start from a spin liquid and we want with these electrons floating around and ask for its instability. Okay, so, so now I'll begin my talk. Um, any questions so far? Online, is anybody on chat? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, did you require some binding energy? Uh, and the answer is yes. So it's not a confinement. They're not confined, but they're just bound. Like, there's, you're gonna, just because there's an attractive potential. Now, the point is the attractive potential, the physics of the binding or the attractive potential is about a T, the hopping matrix element. That likes them to, the hopping matrix element is like a very strong attractive force between a holon and a spin off. So that's a very strong force. Whereas what wants to deconfine is all exchange interaction. That's about a J. So, so the pseudo gap in this picture is, has both. It has the fractionalized excitations, but at the same time, what it doesn't have are holons. <laughs> holons always form a bound state and they just become electrons. So in a sense, I think, I mean, this picture has been around for a while, but uh, even in the early days, but not taking it very seriously. They, certainly the very early papers were just dealing with holons and uh, that just gives you the wrong picture. Although in the sense of phase transition, there's no, well, depends on how you define it. There's no fundamental difference, you know. It's just some feature whether these two particles form a bound state or not. <laughs> uh, uh, so, I mean, it changes the Fermi surface. So if you count the Fermi surface as a fundamental change, then there is a phase transition. But other than that, it's not a very, and the usual picture of a whole on metal um, is okay for J much bigger than T, but not for T much bigger than J. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, yeah, I, I think, I mean, you would get a different type of spin liquid, but I would still bet that the whole ons don't exist. It's always it's always electrons. The charge objects always seem to carry spin. <laughs> Spin-ons would exist, but not the whole ons. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Well, let, let's come to that later. Yeah. So you're talking about now different question from here to here. Yeah. Fundamentally. The only transition has to do with these broken symmetry. So ultimately, it's just an ordinary phase transition of thermal uh, auto parameters. But if you want to understand, uh, you know, details of the spectrum and many other properties, you do have to worry about the fact that there's a spin lock liquid around. Yeah, I mean, yeah, not everything is about phase transition. It's really about crossovers in that sense. In that sense. Uh, question online. Can't hear again. No, no, no. Why are there spin ons to begin with? Is this because hopping T is much larger than J? So it's better to pair whole on and spin on rather than pairing two spin ons? Uh, yes, that's uh, roughly the short answer. I mean, the idea is that the, there's, you know, uh, the pure antiferromagnet is almost a spin liquid. So it wants to form a spin liquid, and now it wants to make space for the holes, and the way, best way it can make space for the holes when T is not bigger than J is actually make them electrons, not holons. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do in uh, the first part of my talk, and uh, keep track of the time here, uh, is actually just talk about the insulator and the spin liquid. So hopefully I convince you the really the important part is to understand the spin liquid. Um, so I'll review, you know, what seems to be the most likely candidate for the spin liquid on the square lattice. Uh, there's been a lot of debate on that, but as you'll see, you know, 
people were talking about the spin, same spin liquid in different ways. That's the more recent realization. Uh, and uh, and then we'll talk about their confinement transitions. And, and the way I'll do it at first is just imagine that I'm still at half filling to make my life simple. Uh, and then I have some, uh, still have charged excitation. So I talked maybe a Hubbard model with smaller U or something. Anyway, but let's, so what do we know about the square lattice antiferromagnet? Well, we know it has nail order. Um, and one possible theory is to take your spins and write them in terms of uh, these bosonic partons or shrinker bosons. Uh, and then when you do a low energy theory of this, uh, the shrinker bosons, um, you get a theory which is familiar to field theorists. It's just a theory of this relativistic complex scalar Z alpha, uh, often called, and it, it carries a U1 gate charge. This is associated with the fact that this decomposition introduces a gauge redundancy. Uh, and this is a so-called CP1 model. It's basically a complex relativistic scalar coupled to U1 gauge field. So when S is negative, then the scalar will condense uh, and that will completely break the U1 gauge symmetry, Higgs it out, and you just get the usual anti ferromagnet So in this case, the Higgs phase has a broken symmetry, which is the anti Um uh, The other more subtle re reason is suppose S is positive so that Z is gapped. Now this Z is the spin-on, which has a relativistic, it's a bosonic relativistic particle at low uh, energies. Uh, so you might think you have a spin liquid, uh, which has a U1, emergent U1 gauge field and these bosonic spin-ons. But that's not true uh, because we know that U1 gauge theory in two dimensions is confining. Uh, and in this case, when you carefully look at what happens when you confine, uh, you get this valence bond solid state. And this comes from these monopoles, which uh, not going to play much of a role today, so I won't say anything more. However, another approach to this spin liquid or the square lattice antiferromagnet uh, is to write these spins in terms of fermions, uh, fermionic partons. That's nothing saying you can't do that. Uh, and in this case, now, if you look for the theory of the fermionic partons, uh, you find that the best state for the fermions is a state where the fermions move in pi flux. Uh, so I'll, I'll show what that is explicitly in a minute. And in this pi flux, if you take a square lattice, fermions hopping on the square lattice pi flux, uh, you get two Dirac fermions, two Dirac nodes. Uh, you know, just like in graphene, you get at zero flux two Dirac cones. But on the, on the square lattice, you need pi flux and you get two Dirac cones. Uh, but more interestingly, in this case, the gauge symmetry is not U1, but SU2, as I'll show in a minute. Okay, so you end up with this theory here. In the end, it's, it's a remarkably simple theory. It's just quantum chromodynamics with SU2 and two flavors of Dirac fermions. Okay, so this, you know, so that's a critical theory. Uh, and so this theory, at least naively says, generically, the system is this critical gapless spin liquid. Uh, with fermionic spin-ons and an SU2 gauge field. But now the question is, you know, what is the role of the SU2 gauge field? Now, if I had, you know, uh, no fermions, I mean, no SU2 gauge field is confining. That's what we learned. Any non abelian gauge force is confining. However, here I have massless fermions. And so then there's a question of, is it confining or not? Uh, okay, so this is something that's been debated a lot uh, in the... Uh, uh, in, in a you know, lot of work over the last 20 plus years. And the answer seems to be that uh, it's almost deconfined, but ultimately it seems to confine at some reasonably long length scale. And furthermore, what are the, what are the possible confining phases? Well, uh, remarkably and reassuringly, you get exactly the same phases uh, that you got from the Schunger boson approach which was the nail and the valence bond solid. So that's, so that's, so in the end, in fact, the fermionic spin-on theory, uh, which is this theory here, and the bosonic spin-on theory, which is this theory here, these are both relativistic theories, but they look very different. Uh, this, at least at the critical point, has one uh, 
uh, well, two massless relativistic scalars coupled to U1 gauge field. Uh, and this has two direct fermions coupled to an SU2 gauge field. Uh, but uh, this beautiful work of Wang et al. argued that, in fact, if these two theories exist as conformal field theories, which ultimately they don't, but they almost do, uh, they're really the same theory. They're dual to each other. Okay. And one of the main reasons is the fact that the confining phases are exactly the same. All right, so now the picture is we have this spin liquid and we now understand two of its possible confining phases, the nail state and the valence bond solid phase. And in fact, this solid valence bond solid is seen in lots of numerical work uh, on the J1, J2 model with first and second neighbor uh, interactions. Okay, so we'd like to ask, are there any other possibilities? And we're going to ask, are there any other possibilities by putting in some charge fluctuations? Right now, the charge is completely quenched. Let's just take, stick, stick to half filling and introduce some charge fluctuations, say in the Hubbard model. Uh, and in fact, one particular model was looked at by Assad et al. Uh, this is a Hubbard model with some, uh, some, some new term they call W. Uh, anyway, it's not important for, you know, I, there's still some issues with this, this particular analysis. But anyway, what they showed, at least in principle, that there could be another phase, which they found uh, to be the D-wave superconductor. So now I want to ask is suppose I start now from this, uh, I'm going to work with the Dirac fermion approach. Suppose I start with this theory, is there a way I can take that theory and confine that to a D-wave superconductor? Okay, so let's, so let's talk about that theory a little bit more. Uh, yes. Yes. Yes, right, yeah. So there's, yeah, so the question is, is there some other route to confinement of the pi flux spin liquid, which we know is the parent of the two phases that we have found. Uh, now, but now we're gonna dope, well, we're not doping yet, but in preparation for doping, we'll just say, okay, let's put in some charge fluctuation, half filling, because that's just a little bit simpler. Okay, and so this is a model where, where they looked at half filling uh, and found, uh, Okay, I think there's some doubt whether they actually found a D-wave superconductor, even Parker was telling me, but anyway, there was some evidence for it. But, so one possibility would be then this, there's actually a second order critical point, uh, and uh, that's described by some new deconfined critical theory, and these are the two confining phases on the other side. But that's not essential for anything I'm going to say about the dope case. All right, so here's the pi flux spin liquid. Uh, so here, I've, there's no SU2 gauge field, which I've dropped. And I've written in a peculiar gauge, which is actually quite useful. I make every hop and matrix element purely imaginary uh, with some orientation that I haven't specified. Um, and, and then there's this EIJ is a fixed field, which has pi flux. So now you see there's pi, uh, pi flux in every plaquette. Okay, so that's EIJ. It's going to go along for the ride. So in this way of writing down the pi flux phase, uh, it's obvious that it has uh, SU2 spin rotation invariance. But there's another hidden SU2 symmetry here, which is completely different, which is the SU2 gauge symmetry. And that becomes apparent when you write it in terms of this number spinner of F up and F dagger down. And then in this particular gauge, you can see that this is what it is. Uh, it just has you know, seemingly the same form, but of course the indices now in the particle hole space, whereas here they were in the spin space. And these are equal. And I do urge you to check it. And this I plays an important role in making these equal. And now in this form, a different symmetry is explicit. It's the difference, it's the symmetry of SU2 rotations acting on the left here. And that's the symmetry of uh, Nambu. Now in this case, it's a global symmetry, but once you put the SU2 gauge field, which you now can do in the usual way, uh, this will become an SU2 gauge symmetry. Uh, question. Okay, go ahead, Andre, with your question. 
Uh, yes, Uber. Uh, just to clarify, the object you're starting from, the spin is SU2 object, right? It's SU2 invariant. Um, so what is the reason that when you use the CP1 bosonic representation, you end up with the U1 gauge theory? But if you use the fermions, so pseudo fermions, you end up with SU2. Uh, yeah, so first of all, fermions, you don't always end up with SU2. You end up for the pi flux uh, uh, saddle point only. If you do some other saddle point, you don't have the SU2 gauge invariance. It's just a very special feature of this pi flux saddle point. And exactly what I was saying, there's, uh, the fermion anti-commutation relations are important in showing that the psi region is equal to the F, upon, that, that these two are equal. If you try to do this with bosons, you'll find they're not equal. I yeah. see. So, you know, but the, that's a good point. But the magic is that, uh, you know, uh, despite that, you know, the, that whole intricate structure is just right uh, to make this U1 gauge theory from bosons, uh, this U1 gauge theory from bosons to be the same uh, as the SU2 gauge theory with fermions. So that's the, that's, you know, one of those remarkable uh, dualities. Uh, and ultimately, it follows from the fact that on the lattice scales, you know, it's the same theory. There's no difference at the, when you lose the lattice forms. Okay, so there's another question. Uh, Fabio, go ahead. Hi, Sabi. Thank you for the good talk. Look, you are saying that you are including charge fluctuations at health theory. But just to yeah. clarify some points, uh, when we are at, at half feeling in the Hubert model, usually the charge degrees of freedom are frozen. Are, are frozen. How do you yeah. quantify the charge fluctuations? Okay, so if you want something definite in your mind, uh, look at this Hamiltonian here of Assad et al. So this is the Hubbard model, but U over T is four. So, you know, not that large, but it's reasonably, it's not infinite, it's U over T is four. And then they added extra term W. And this W term, you know, actually prefers Cooper pairs, so it wants charge fluctuations around. And so this particular model has a superconducting ground state. So it's in the, you have to really take the full space of the Hubbard model and you put in some terms that make the, it's prefer pair formation in this case. Uh, singlet formation and for the pairs to move around. This is like a pair hopping term, right. this case square term. Okay. Look, I mean, this is just look, for, uh, this is just to, yeah, uh, this is just to give you some idea. I mean, I, I, that, that particular model is not important for any, you know, any details that I'm going to discuss. Right. So, All right. Uh, for instance, uh, this here is for we coupling, right? Well, uh, you know, like my picture is I just want some, I want to start with this, uh, this pi flux phase for which there's a, now, you know, quite a bit of numerical evidence that it describes physics correctly up to say, you know, on the square lattice, I don't know, uh, maybe near, at least near the critical point up to 10, 20 lattice spacings. Uh, so I just want to use this theory and ask for what are different instabilities of it. Okay, just right. maybe you just wait a few minutes, you'll see where I'm going. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for okay. your gentle attention. So what I want to do is to confine this theory. Um, and so I have an SU2 gauge field around and I want to confine it. So one way to confine an SU2 gauge field uh, is to do what happens in the theory of weak interactions. You take an Higgs boson, which is a fundamental of SU2 and you condense it. And then you get the theory of Fermi theory of weak interactions for which you don't need any gauge field. I mean, all the gauge boson become massive. So that's, uh, you know, you can view it as a Higgs or a confining phase. They're pretty much the same because it's a fundamental of SU2. So I wonder, if, so maybe that's the one thing I should do is condense some boson, uh, which is a fundamental of SU2. I don't want it to carry spin because uh, I, I, I'm not interested in phases that break spin rotation symmetry. Uh, and uh, but I do want to get superconductivity. What I'd like to do is get some theory which gives has a superconducting ground state, which is at least uh, adiabatically connected to the BCS state. So this boson uh, then must carry charge. And now the boson has an SU2 gate charge. So if I'm going to make uh, my Cooper pair of charge to E, 
it has to be a composite of this boson. So this, so really the only thing I can do is give the boson chart E. So basically I could just postulate that there's some low energy boson, some Higgs field, which has charge E and is a fundamental of SU2. Okay, so, so at one level I can do that. I'll, later on, if, if I have time, I'll show you how in the Ancilla theory, there's a very natural candidate for this boson. Uh, and this boson is actually, as appeared in this work of Ben and Lee, uh, it's basically the slave boson for the SU2 gauge theory. When you take your electron and you decompose it in this way, um, it has the same quantum numbers, but this is not a picture that I'm advocating in terms of uh, this kind of fractionalization because I just emphasize the electron doesn't fractionalize, it just becomes, uh, there are no holons around. But anyway, it's a bose, I'll give a different definition of the boson, but it has the same quantum numbers as this boson. Okay. So right now, the only thing that's going to matter are the quantum numbers and the symmetry operations. Okay. But one thing I do notice from this, which is quite generally true, that these fermions experience a flux, as I just showed you. The electron doesn't appear in experience any flux. The electron is a gauge invariant object, which doesn't see any flux. So there must be some flux that these Bs experience to cancel the flux of the F. So basically it tells you that the, these boson must move in pi flux. Now there's a more sophisticated version of this called the projective symmetry group. So you can work out the projective symmetry group of these bosons uh, and it's easy to work it out once you know the projective symmetry group of the fermions. And then from that, you can write down the most general, at least time independent terms in the Hamiltonian uh, of the bosons. So there's of course the usual boson mass term then there's the hopping term, which actually has exactly the same form. It must, because there must be pi flux. And, okay. And then you can keep going. And this is what the calculation we did. So at this point, all we're using and nothing more is the fact that these fermions have a certain projective symmetry group and therefore the bosons must have the corresponding projective symmetry group. That's all we're using. So, yes. Yes, it's not flavor. So it becomes flavor if you write it in terms of Majorana fermions. So you have two complex fermions. If you write it in terms of Majorana fermions, there are four Majorana fermions. Then there's an O4 symmetry. Uh, SU2, O4 is SU2 plus SU2. Uh, and SU2 is the spin and SU2 is the number. The number is gauged. The spin is never, yeah, spin is not gauge at least in what we're talking about right now. <laughs> okay. All right, so you can now look for quartic terms uh, and these are the ones we found. Um, and they are built out of bilinears of the bosons which have a very simple physical interpretation. So this B dagger B under symmetry is just like the local de charge density on the site I then this uh, kinetic energy of the fermions becomes this particular combinations of the Bs. You know, why is it imaginary about that? You have to look at the details of the PSG. Similarly, the current on any bond, J, is, is the real part of this. And finally, there's a pairing amplitude, which is also gauge invariant and charge 2E. So this is just the usual BCS auto parameter on the bond. So out of the Bs, you can construct all of these objects that are very physical. Uh, so these are, if you wish, you know, the B is the fractionalization of all of these auto parameters together, <laughs> uh, depending on which combination of the Bs you take. And then the quartic terms in the B are all basically squares of these auto parameters in some obvious way. All right, so now we just do you know, the very simplest thing, uh, which is just minimize this uh, energy for the Bs and see what are the phases you get when the B condenses that with Higgs phase, where you are already confined. That's really uh, all we have done. So, so, so the condensation is controlled by two things. One is that there's this dispersion. So you want to, the bees want to sit at the minimum of this dispersion. And the second are these various quartic terms, which will prefer one or more of these orderings. Uh, one interesting point is that there is never any phase with no ordering. Uh, 
uh, and that follows on the fact that these bees move in pi flux. So, so there's, and that's good because you don't want to get some trivial phase. Uh, then you violate some various fundamental theorems here. Uh, okay. So, what is the dispersion of the bees or the fermions? Well, you just take this kinetic energy, uh, which is the same for fermions and bosons. So, the dispersion is the same. Uh, so there's the dispersion in some That's section of the Brillouin zone. Okay. Yes, go ahead. No. So now with the fermions, of course, fermions uh, are half filled. Uh, so you, the important things are the direct nodes for the fermions. But for these bosonic charge-ons, you know, in the uh, the un in the in SU two gate theory, they get they have massive excitation. So the most important part of the bosons are actually at these points, at the minima, not at the direct nodes. So I get two minima, just like I had two direct nodes, uh, and we call these minima B minus and B plus. So the simplest assumption is that you're just going to condense this B minus and B plus. So you just look at these wave vectors, and you look at the form of the free energy and the various order parameters, and then you see that no matter what you condense, what linear combination of B minus and B plus you condense, you will get one of three order parameters. So you get a stripe with period pi. Uh, uh, and you know, all of this follows from this symmetry analysis. This is one possible outcome. You have a stripe phase or charge density wave. You have this, what's called the D density waves, a bit of a misnomer because this is, there's no density. It's really a current. There's a spontaneous current flowing in a checkerboard pattern in the d-density wave. And quite you know, remarkably, as kind of was known in the early days of cuprates also, you get a d-wave superconductor, not an s-wave. You get exactly a d-wave where the order parameter changes sign under 90 degree rotations. So the pi flux phase is very closely connected to a d-wave superconductor. And it, that comes out of this kind of condensation requirement. So which of these phases you get, of course, depends upon uh, uh, the various couplings here, uh, these couplings over here, which we so far are just numbers that we put in. Okay, so then to summarize what we have learned from this analysis of these, this one single extra Higgs field, uh, you know, which will be floating in the literature for a long time, but for some reason, this kind of simple analysis of uh, PSG wasn't done for, for, for this case. Anyway, so when you do it carefully, this is what you find. These are the three phases. Uh, I should say there was uh, some very nice work by the MIT group, uh, Nagosa, Lee, and Wen, uh, where they looked, did something like this for the staggered flux phase, which is a U1 gauge theory. In that case, what you get are the last two possibilities. You don't get the stripe order. Uh, once you do the SU2, you get the stripe order. <laughs> Okay, so the idea is that there's, you know, now, that now there's two parameters I have to play with, uh, at least one, well, let me look at the function of this parameter R, this mass work. So when R is large and positive, the B won't condense. Then I just have the pure gauge theory. And that I already talked about, we know that that's a confining gauge theory and it will be either the nail phase or the VBS phase. Now you decrease R, uh, then you were going to condense at these points. Sorry, I went backwards. Uh, and you're going to get these three phases I talked about. So here's the pictures of them. There's the stripe phase. This is the D density wave, which has currents. Uh, this is the D wave superconductor. And these are the couplings, the quartic couplings, two of them that give you all three phases. And this is where, this is the Higgs phase. So these are you know, where we want to be at low temperatures when you come down from the pseudo gap. At this point, we're not, not coming down from the pseudo gap. We're just coming down from a pure spin liquid uh, and then finding that when we condense this boson, you can get these three phases. And only these three, nothing else. This is the most, uh, sorry, at least in the limit where you're dominated by these low energy bosons, then these are the only three possibilities. Yes. Uh, so we, we, we're taking this theory and just minimizing it. That's all. It's a mean field theory. This is the hopping term for the boson. This is the quartic term of the boson. We just minimize it. 
uh, and uh, yeah, so this V1 and J1, I should say, this is all done by main. <laughs> uh, the V1 and J1, or J1 and K1. Okay, where is K1? Uh, K1 is there. Okay, these are two of just some section. Uh, that's, <laughs> you want to say what the purple is? <laughs> yeah, the numerics is done with finite resolution. <laughs> um, okay, so as a function of R then, you have the, so there's kind of two different phases. One is the phase where the SC2 gauge theory confines on its own. It's like a, it's more like QCD, the confinement in the presence of massless fermions. Uh, and, uh, you know, if in, uh, so, so this side is like QCD where you have confinement and, you know, it gives a proton in QCD here, it gives the analog of the protons uh, are the valence bond solid in the nail phases. This side is where you condense the Higgs field, which is fundamental of SC2. There is more like the weak interactions. Now the weak interactions, however, don't break any symmetry. That's simply the nature of the weak interactions. But here, because of the, the PSG of the bosons, they, you always will break a symmetry. Uh, you either be a deviate superconductor or period two stripes or the D density of all. And, and so now here's the simple theory that describes everything in principle. Uh, at least up to quad quadratic order, is just massless uh, relativistic fermions uh, and these bosons, and then various quartic terms. And depending on all the quartic terms, you can get one of these uh, uh, five different phases. Okay, so another point is that uh, if you just take this theory and the quartic terms are just right, this theory has two different SO5 symmetries. Uh, there's an SO5 symmetry in the bosonic sector, uh, and that corresponds to the fact the that, fact. you know, the two complex boson, which makes it, uh, for, uh, well, there's four complex boson because there's the SU2 index and, and the valley index, which makes it eight, know, eight real bosons, which then if you mod out an SO3 gauge field, gives you an SO5 symmetry. And that's the same with the fermions too. So there's an SO5 cross SO5 symmetry, at least if the quartic terms are just right. Uh, and this tells you why you have five order parameters in the sense of the number of components. The nail order parameter has three components, the valence bond solid order has two components, three plus two is five. Here the D-wave superconductor is a complex number, so it has two components. The stripes have two components because the X or Y, and this is one, so two plus two plus one is also five. So this is how uh, the numerology works out uh, beautifully. So, Beer, I have a question here. Yes. Uh, uh, so, is the boson relativistic or non relativistic? Because the yeah. bottom boson band is quadratic dispersion relation. Of course, yes. No, no, this is only for quadratic, and there can be all kinds of quartic terms. And uh, yeah, who knows whether the SO5 cross SO5 symmetry would really actually survive. Uh, but we can at least postulate at the level of conformal field theories uh, that there is a if the quartic terms are all uh, have just right, there's a fixed point, uh, which is a deconfined quantum critical point with SO5 cross SO5 symmetry. And this one, I, I think there's a reasonable charge actually exists <laughs> in the space of conformal field theories because it's got plenty of uh, massless particles to, to confine the SU2 gauge field. So you assume even boson part have a linear dispersion relation due to interaction. Uh, so right, I'm at half filling right now. So the bosons are relativistic too. That's why uh, I'm talking about half filling. <laughs> I'm right now yeah, at half filling. But, I'm, but I'm, I'm worried about the, the boson dispersion is quadratic near bottom of band. Yes. If the boson the low filling near bottom band, they have a quadratic dispersion relation, it's the omega yeah, and this, square this dispersion is, relation. Yeah, that's so does this. This uh, It's just square root of k square plus r square is the dispersion here. So as long as you have particle hole symmetry and you're half filling, then the bosons have a relativistic dispersion. 
yeah. So this so is what I have ask a simple question. Yes. Uh, so just for understanding, so at this stage, the theory doesn't allow a coexistence of, say, nail order and D-wave superconductivity. You have either uh, one or the other, right? All of these things could happen. You know, I haven't, I've just done mean field theory. <laughs> uh, and now when we do the full TSC2 gauge theory, who knows? I mean, is this, there could be coexistence here, there could be a conformal fixed point. I mean, the possibilities are very rich. Uh, and it'd be great to study all of those, even. Even so, I mean, the nice thing about this model is that uh, it's at half filling. <laughs> so if you can find some nice lattice regularization, there's no sign problem uh, and it can all be studied in principle and all of these uh, five phases and this, you know, maybe there is a SO5 to SO5 DQCP in there, maybe not, or maybe there's coexistence, who knows? I think this is a wonderful topic for many PhD thesis, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, one thing I will say, you know, I mean, so much effort has been expended, uh, very good effort to understand this transition. Uh, and I think ultimately now the consensus is when you do the, when you do the bootstrap in particular, uh, that this, this is not, there is no conformal field theory here. But I'm willing to bet there is a conformal field theory here for the right model. That it, it's not, at least in principle, it's possible. It's not that it just, not an allowed conformal field here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're really lucky, this low energy theory describes. Okay, somebody, one second. Uh, yeah, if you're really lucky, this is a low energy theory of this model. Uh, we, I don't know that. I have no evidence for that. Uh, but this is a the type of model we're talking about. Yes. So if you put a T prime that would break particle symmetry, then you'll have you could have uh, various first order terms in the bosons. It could be that those terms are irrelevant at the CFT with some strongly coupled CFT. So that's not a complete killer, but uh, it certainly will make it less likely that you get the CFT. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, the basic message is that when I go to the dope case, the structure of all the possible phases will basically be the same with some small modifications. Uh, but yes, the nature of the phase conditions, once you're at finite doping and you have Fermi surfaces and other long range interactions and broken particle symmetry, the quantum phase conditions could be completely different. And they probably are. But the phases that you get just by simple considerations of symmetry and confinement will be the same. <laughs> uh, almost, uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, uh, right, so the ultimate only actual symmetries in the problem are uh, SU2 spin rotation invariance uh, and various lattice translation and rotation symmetry. Those are the actual symmetries. So this is an emergent symmetry. Uh, and if the quartic couplings are just right, then, in this, then they are decoupled, they're different. But there are certainly allowed terms, which we're hoping are irrelevant for this model. Uh, which will couple them, which actually, because a big part of this SO5, both SO5s are lattice, they're the same operation. So there are terms that can couple them together. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and um, also, uh, uh, there's also U1 charge conservation. That's also an exact symmetry. Yeah, go ahead. Please, uh, in some moment, uh, you said that uh, it can be possible to have a confined quantum critical point. Right. Yes. Uh, how can we differentiate this quantum, the confined quantum critical point between the nail order and the D density wave order? And uh, what is the universality class of this phase trans transition? Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, 
Sure, great question. So, so let me just go back uh, so to this deconfined, proposed deconfined critical point over many years ago. Uh, this one here. Uh, so here you have uh, one description of it, SU2 gauge theory coupled to two massless Dirac fermions, okay? And right. this theory, this theory has an exact SO5 symmetry uh, in which there's no nothing that distinguishes between the nail order and the VBS order. But what we believe is that uh, there's some either, well, if there is, if it's really a DCP, then, the, then there's only irrelevant perturbations. There's no irrelevant. Uh, and then some of, sorry, uh, yeah, there's, there's a relevant perturbation, but there's some irrelevant terms, uh, which eventually will tell you about which side you're on. Okay. But now we know that this DQCP doesn't exist, that the two Dirac fermions are not sufficient to turn off the confinement force of the SE2 gauge field. So now I'm proposing, at least as theoretically, you know, who knows what that has anything to do with the actual model, but as a theoretical conformal field theory, I'm pretty confident it exists. Uh, where, you know, again, you have only an SE2 gauge field, but at the critical point, you both have two, two massless fermions and two complex bosons. So now there's more, more massless matter to, to, uh, to destroy the confinement. So then there's a good chance that this exists. So this is then a, a, a conformal field theory, which hopefully exists, and I'm betting it does, uh, which will have an SO5 towards SO5 global symmetry. So in principle, somebody doing bootstrap would just start with that information. Is there, <laughs> is there a CFT with an SO5 plus SO5 global symmetry with a few other properties that you could, you could look for it? Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Thank, thank you for your answer. Sure, go ahead. Uh, and, about, look, and about universal class, could you say some comments? That's all I have to say. I mean, this is this is. I mean, we haven't computed any exponents yet, but anyway, go ahead. Right, right. Thank you. So, Beer, I try to confirm this. Uh, if a boson density is low at the mean field level, will the boson have a quadratic dispersion relation or linear dispersion? So the boson relation? density is zero. This particle holds yeah. symmetric. It have so, a linear dispersion relation. So the boson uh, action, Xiao Gang, is, uh, is right here, where mu has both space and time, okay? So this is a d tau b squared. This is an yeah. offset, eh? Yeah. But however, and this seems to uh, contradict with uh, your previous uh, picture. In a few slides before, you have this uh, uh, band for boson. Yeah, oh, this here. Is... Yeah, that's, that one uh, seems to say it's quadratic specialist. So that's no, where what I'm confused. Squared. So this, no, this k squared here, uh, gives you the k squared over here. There's grad b squared here. That's all. It's the time but, derivative term that makes it relativistic, not the k. Yeah, but uh, but uh, the time derivative usually for boson is uh, just a linear time derivative. You know, when you I agree. A, when you're yeah. finite doping, but not at half filling. I'm talking about half filling. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. At the moment, about I'm talking about alpha. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is a small U theory at half But But okay, now I'm, I want to get to finite doping. So that's, yeah, then, uh, you know, then I would say at finite doping, there is a time derivative term and I have to worry about it. And it's not ruled out that the first order time derivative is irrelevant because there's some strongly coupled CFT. It could well be that that uh, particle hole asymmetry is uh, irrelevant, but yeah, who knows? But it's there and, and one would have to worry about it. But I won't say anything about conformal field theories that away from after that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, let's go on. So now um, I have about half an hour left. Okay. No, 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 no. This is great. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to give another talk. So now, now I'll try to, I want to move to the doping case. Uh, and so I've given you this theory of confinement and half filling to, to states we love, like the charge density wave and the, and the D wave superconductor. <laughs> so that's exciting, I hope. Uh, and now let's just talk about the pseudo gap, but then we'll put it together. 
So how do we think about the pseudo gaps? We want an actual theory of all of this. Uh, so this is one way to do it. Let's start with the Hubbard model. Uh, and then we decouple the Hubbard interaction in terms of a paramagnon. You think of as some quantum rotor. So then you have a theory of this quantum rotor coupled to free fermions. That's the usual paramagnon theory. Uh, so here's a picture of it. You have these quantum rotors. Uh, some particles moving on a sphere with a second order uh, kinetic energy uh, coupled to these fermions. Okay, this is just a rewriting of the Hubbard model. But now I'm going to take these quantum rotors, uh, which you know, which has a singlet ground state and a triplet excited state and, and an infinite set of states, just like a particle on a sphere, and approximate it by just two states, the singlet and the triplet. So that's four, sorry. So I'm going to replace the rotor by uh, a pair of spinner halves with coupling J perp. So now, and I'm going to couple this. Uh, uh, this uh, this is now a, a you know a dimer a square lattice of dimers, uh, and I'm going to couple it to the physical electrons uh, with this coupling lambda, and I claim that's just a way of writing the the whole Hubbard model. Uh, so here I have a you know a spin one excitation, which is the paramagnon, which is coupled to this. So now let me write everything in terms of these spins. I have this J perp coupling, which wants these spins to be uh, singlets, and a coupling I'll call J condo, which couples this spin to that one. Uh, and the original paramagnon is just the difference of these two spins. Okay, but now let's just take this model. I could have started with this model. So this is a three-layer antiferromagnet. That is a three-layer model. The top layer uh, is a Hubbard was originally a Hubbard model, uh, but now it just has free electrons uh, at any density, and it's coupled to this bilayer antiferromagnet. And now the point is that in the limit J perp is much bigger than J k. This is just the way of writing down the Hubbard model, because you can just do the usual schieffer wolf transformation, and you'll find that there's a Hubbard interaction on the top layer, which is just j per, jk squared over j perp. And one way you can see that is if there's only one electron here, then you're happy because you gain some energy because of the jk. Uh, but if there's, uh, uh, no, if there's two electrons or no electrons, then you're unhappy because there's no spin to gain energy with this chain. So it's the usual type of argument, and you'll find that. So jk and j perp are really large because they're really about a u. All right, so this is just a rewriting of the Hubbard model. Now, of course, if J perp is much bigger than J k, then I have done nothing. I just, I, these will form singlets and I'm back to the old problem. But now imagine that there's some RG going on. And we know in RG, this condo coupling, J k uh, becomes strong. So imagine that this J k is runs off to infinity under some RG. Whereas the, this other coupling is ferromagnetic and uh, so, well, uh, it doesn't flow at all. So imagine that somehow the system goes to a regime where JK is much bigger than J perp. What do you get then? Well, I claim you get the pseudo gap. And how do you get that? Well, what will happen then uh, is that the top two layers will form uh, uh, a large, like a condo lattice and they form a large Fermi surface. And how, what is the size of the Fermi surface? Well, it's the density of holes in the top layer, which is one plus P. The density of holes in the second layer, which is one, which is two plus P, which is just P model two. And this bottom layer we left over to form a spin liquid. So here's a picture of it. So the top two layers is a condo lattice and the bottom layer is a spin liquid, uh, and which is resonating around uh, and therefore, my slogan for the pseudo gap metal is this equation. <laughs> you remember everything, remember this. Uh, pseudo gap metal is equal to condo lattice heavy Fermi liquid plus spin liquid. Uh, so the point is that, you know, these two layers, uh, this, this condo screening, and then you get the large Fermi surface, but in this case, large is really small modulo two, but you're left over with the spin liquid. And this spin liquid here, now you can see very clearly in this picture, at least in this naive decoupling, uh, 
is just like an insulating spin liquid. There's no difference. It's PSG is exactly the same. It's just there. Uh, and that's why I'm calling it F and not F2, because this was the F I was referring to in the first part of my talk. It's this, this particular spin liquid right here. Uh, so that's one possible phase. Uh, and uh, at least a large JK, we get exactly the characteristic of the pseudo gap. Uh, and a small JK, of course, the spins will form singlets as usual, and then you're back to the large Fermi surface. So uh, Yahui and I have written at least a couple of papers discussing this transition, actually also with uh, uh, Maria and Alex. Uh, we have a paper also thinking about this transition. That's not what I'm talking about at all, uh, but uh, I'm focusing on this region here for the pseudo gap. So in terms of the partons I've been talking about before, I've already told you these F are my spin-ons. Uh, and what are my electrons? Well, the electrons have a small Fermi surface coming from combining the top two layers. So this is how I think about it. pseudo metal, metal, the, the C alpha gets screened by the F1 to form a, a small Fermi surface. And this, since it's a condo, effect, there's a slave boson associated with that. That slave boson is just the hybridization of C alpha with F1. So this is the Higgs field that's condensed in the pseudo gap. When I want to go to the Fermi liquid, I have to worry about this Higgs field. But since I'm not talking about that, I won't worry about that Higgs field and leave it condensed. Or what about the B that's been the central actor of my analysis so far? Well, that B is the overlap of these two fermions here between F1 and F. Uh, and you can see there's two ways of doing it and just still getting charge E because the F1 has charge E. The F is just neutral and you can get these two combinations and these are the two combinations of the B that I was talking about. So you can now literally start from this model uh, where this is condensed and B is not and you know integrate out all the fermions and in principle derive actual numbers for, uh, for all of my effective action that I was talking about before. Uh, and if you make the C's exactly at half filling, then you will get the theory I've talked about. And now we can also talk about what happens when the C's are not exactly at half filling. The calculation is almost exactly the same, except the symmetries are a bit lower. Okay, great. Any questions? So that's my theory of the pseudo gap, or our theory, sorry. <laughs> uh, how are boson boson interaction displayed in the theory? Example, the low, you can't see it. The low energy theory of a mean field state of fermionic spin ons moving on a square lattice for five flux is the Z2 center of the SU2 can be this. Uh, I'm not sure I understand this question. Uh, there, you know, the boson boson interactions which are, are precisely, precisely these quartic terms, I presume, refer to the Bs, you know. These are the possible boson boson interactions uh, because it's quartic in the Bs, and we just wrote them down by symmetry and PSG and not much else. Uh, but uh, that's all it is. Um, go ahead, somebody had a question. All right, so, so let me ask, uh, are there any questions on this picture of the pseudo gap here? Yeah, this is the final theory of the pseudo gap metal. Uh, where you do have a spin liquid, and I believe the most likely candidate for the spin liquid uh, is the pi flux phase, which is just the dual of the CP1 model. Uh, that seems to be, you know, what's seen in all the numerics uh, when you frustrate the square lattice antiferromagnet, and we are now arguing it also seems to give you exactly the right phases uh, that you want at low temperature. So could I, um, could I ask to clarify? So in the first part of the talk, you had conduction electrons and they were living in the in the sea of the spins or spin-ons um, that you formed by fractionalizing the spins using either the CP1 bosons or, uh, or the fermions, right? And you talked about the emergent SO5 fermion cross SU5 boson. But in this theory that you're describing in the second part, you now have two kind of pseudo spins, S1 and S2. One is charged and the electric field, the other is not. So the theory seems to be richer, has more ingredients. Um, so, well, you know, well, no, so, so the advantage of this theory, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I understand your question. So the advantage of this theory, it goes back to the beginning part of my talk. This theory, if you look at the charged excitations in this theory at the Fermi surface, they're very naturally uh, electrons because of the top two layers. Whereas in the old approach or the slave boson approach, well, in this case, you actually have to use the, you have to make the bose, the charge carriers oh, fermions yeah. to get the whole pockets, to get the whole on metal. Well, the courage should go back in there. So I'm going to get you. It. They don't make posters anymore. Okay. Uh, yeah, so here, you know, you don't even, to get the whole on, this this theory, if you, if you literally did this factorization, which is not what I'm doing, I only wrote this down, first of all, to give credit to where it was introduced first. And secondly, to, to give you the argument that uh, this, this fixes the symmetry transformations. But I'm not actually doing this fractalization. The way I'm getting the B bosons is the way I've described it. Because if you do it this way, the bosons carry charge and they don't give you a Fermi surface at all. You don't even get any Fermi arcs unless you mm -hmm. bind the B and the F together, which is something Wen and Lee talked about. Uh, and I'm just showing you that binding of the B and the F to give you the small pockets is much more simply done by this, this, this ancillary construction. I see. And in this case, the capital B corresponds to which, which of the two kind of spins? Is it the S1 or the S2? It's the overlap between the S1 and the S2. I see. You can see from. Yeah. Okay. So the, once, once this, uh, this is non-zero, these spin-ons uh, acquire a charge. That's exactly what happens in the condo lattice too. The spins become charged. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have the heavy Fermi liquid phase. So the F one has a charge. And so now you notice it's F dagger, F dagger in both. So that gives you a charge E object. So the F are still neutral spin-ons, but they can appear in two different ways. And consistent with, if, if you have an SU2 gauge theory here, this is what you would make. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so we are, I have a yeah, trivial I mean, notational I mean, question if you have. Yes, please go ahead, Andre. Yeah. It's really a trivial notational question. What is pseudo about your pseudo gap? Is it a true gap? I mean, is it that uh, you re have a real gap in where the Fermi surface was in FL phase? It, it, there's a real gap there, that's correct. It's only pseudo because it's finite temperature. Well, but the also, theory is zero temperature. Uh, yes. Well, we are. So the underlying assumption is that this kind of well, the theory is always confining at zero temperature, we believe. But we, we, we are treating temperature as a way to access some of the short distance physics where we think there's deconfinements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and evidence for that comes from studies of the square lattice where people do see something like this, at least for first period mm -hmm. square lattice. I mean, it's like UCD, you know? UCD is always confining their protons, but we can still talk about quarks by high energy experiments. It's a very similar philosophy here. <laughs> In the ground state, I mean, it would have been nice to have a ground state which was deconfined. And that could happen, for example, if this was a Z2 spin liquid. Uh, and I'm sure you know I've written many papers with that hope. Uh, but at this point, I, I don't, there's never been any clear evidence of that, of any deconfinement at zero temperature in any experiment. So. That's one of the reasons I, I'm not working with the Z2 spin liquid anymore, but working with this one. This one confines, and now I'm viewing that as a good thing, not a bad thing. <laughs> okay. So can I, can I follow up on this question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, the question is whether um, this gives you small Fermi pockets. I guess I got that. Does it also give you arcs or does it give you circular pockets? So how does it? Yeah, so yeah, I showed you some actual data of a calculation in mean field theory. Uh, that was right here. Oops, what's going on? Oh, don't die. Yeah, so this is an actual calculation uh, in this paper. Uh, so this is what you get. Uh, there is a, it's much weaker at the back, but it has, you know, it has a little, so we have, so this paper has a lot of analysis, not just at zero frequency, but even as a function of frequency. There's lots of spectral functions in this region. It has spectral functions over here as a function of momentum and frequency. It has also an analysis of these kind of uh, uh, non-monotonic dispersion with minima not near the KF. All of that works. And this is in this paper. Okay. 
Thank you. And um, you know, I've given many talks on that. I, I imagine I have others. And, uh, <laughs> But it's uh, ultimately, it seems like the finite temperature state. All right, so finally, let's put all this together. Uh, so what am I going to do? So I have now, I've described this theory of the pseudo gap metal, uh, which has whole pocket Fermi surfaces, meaning it's gonna have charge E Fermi surfaces, underlying pi flux spin liquid. Uh, and this is now going to confine as you lower the temperature. Uh, and it's sort of the parent of everything else in the phase diagram. Uh, okay. And, and then this, so it has, there's many different things I could do. So for example, I could treat the pi flux spin liquid uh, as a, in, in the CP1 formulation, I could write it in terms of the bosons, bosonic spinons. Uh, those are supposed to be equivalent. So then I have this boson Z alpha, which I can then condense and what will you get? Well, uh, you will get uh, this state here. You'll get spin density wave order. You get whole pockets. And in fact, now there's some very beautiful experiments showing you know, the full whole pocket in the presence of nail order um, by Kondo et al uh, at low doping. Okay, so, so, so if you condense the Z alpha, you get this. Then on the other hand, if you condense the B, <laughs> Then I've shown you at least at half filling, uh, you get D-wave superconductivity um, and you get charge density wave of period two. So we've done a very simple theory so far. We've uh, put in some longer range hopping for, for the boson. I only had nearest neighbor hopping. So you can do a PSG analysis and uh, put in longer range couplings of various types. I mean, there's a lot of freedom. So this is by no means a systematic analysis. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you do get various stripe phases, even with period four you wanted. They seem to have some other broken symmetries in most cases, and maybe that's an artifact of mean field theory, maybe not. So these are all interesting questions we hope to study further. Uh, but the D-wave superconductor survives, it's still there, uh, depending on, again, there's many parameters now in the theory that you can read about in our paper. And finally, there's, of course, the strange metal. Uh, so that I have not talked about at all. I just referred to it very briefly. Uh, that has to do with a, a completely different Higgs theory with a completely different Higgs boson. Uh, that's the Higgs boson between the top two layers. It's this Higgs boson between the first layer and the second layer. Uh, that gives you some rather exotic uh, theory again, it's a it's an SU two gauge theory, but it's a different SU two gauge. It's the SU two gauge field associated with where you gauge the spin, uh, and uh, so that's our best bet on what's going on along arrow C. All right, so that's basically it. <laughs> so uh, this is the parent of everything, and uh, it's a nice parent because it seems to give a simple root to all the children that we see at low temperatures. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. How can you test this theory? Oh, yeah, great question. <laughs> uh, well, uh, let's see. So, I mean, high in my in my wish list would be to uh, to actually see the backside of these pockets at, at finite doping in a regime where you don't have uh, long range order. Now, it may be that there isn't any backside, the systems are disordered, maybe you can make it cleaner, and then maybe at finite temperature they can wash out. So even if they don't see it, I'm not ready to give up yet. We have, however, you know, in the previous paper I mentioned, all kinds of detailed spectral functions uh, and which work. I mean, uh, now I should say there are many other proposals, especially by, uh, by so-called YRZ theory. And that has basically the same Green's functions uh, and that works. But the YRZ theory doesn't have is the spin liquid. So in the YRZ theory, you couldn't do what everything we did today. You couldn't do it with that because it, it, it's a bit cavalier with treating the, the whole uh, Leibniz theorem properly, in my opinion. Um, 
then there's a question of, yeah, I'm, you know, I think one of the big open questions is really what is the nature of the charge density wave at high field with quantum oscillations? So I'm hopeful that this theory can give you uh, uh, some detailed picture of those Fermi surface in the, uh, in the charge ordered phase. This TVA naturally gives you very similar TCs for CDW and DSC uh, because there's this approximate SO5 symmetry between them. So it gives you the same energy scale for charge order and superconductivity. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's just, it's hard to make a prediction because there's so much data out there. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, what prediction can we make? Well, let's see. Uh, I think we need to, you know, if we can really make this whole quant thing quantitative, a better analysis of the of the full theory of these of this uh, bosons and spin-ons, you know, it's the gauge theory. So we need, I think, what I, what we really need are some serious lattice gauge theory studies of this model, and I think that will hopefully enable some quantitative tests eventually. <laughs> but in my lifetime, I hope. <laughs> Yes. Okay, Greg. Uh, Ramshaw et al. used angle resolved magneto oscillation measure for to find a four pocket, including the backside in the underdope cuprates. Uh, is this a very recent experiment, Greg? Sorry, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. Sorry, yeah, I was muted. Uh, yeah, it's it's a very recent paper. I was uh, looking for on my hard drive. I'll I'll send it to you. If I find it, is this in a regime with a oh 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 yeah okay this is the is this quantum oscillations or it's angle ADMR? It's angle resolved magneto resistance oscillation, so it's not the standard, you know. Yeah. S -band alpha oh, yes, yes. Cost. It's it's right, right. right. <laughs> magnetic field. Yes. Okay. I'm okay. I'm aware of the previous paper. Yeah. Okay. ADMR. Okay. I wasn't counting ADMR as observation, but Maybe in this case they have much more cleaner data because well, it's 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 a pretty it's a pretty tried and true technique. It's actually the first measurement of a Fermi surface in the cuprate. It was an overdope thallium uh, some time ago by Nigel Hussey, and that ends up being well reproduced by quote unquote real quantum oscillations. Okay, well that's that's wonderful then. All right, great. I'm delighted to hear that. So all right, so then there's much better evidence. For the backside, then uh, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting interesting paper to look at, and and AMRO by its nature does not have to have a mega C tau greater than one to start revealing the physics of the Fermi surface. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it had claimed that uh, in the previous paper, and uh, um, and yeah, I show their data in many talks I give. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, at least the older one. I haven't seen the latest paper, and uh, you know, it involves some. Some Boltzmann equation solution, which did re require it, the, the full pocket, and but now they have more cleaner evidence for the motion on the backside. You're saying, right? And and it's it's harder to go from the data to the conclusion, particularly as a reader, because you know, there is modeling to get the angle dependent data in a way that yeah. you don't have to do with you know real quantum oscill oscillations, where it's a simple Fourier transform. But right. I found paper very compelling. Okay, well, I'm delighted to hear that. So, especially coming from you. So, great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, what happens in your theory if you assume a staggered flux spin liquid rather than the pi flux spin liquid background? Uh, yes, yeah, so if you do the staggered flux, I mentioned this briefly, uh, basically, you know, you, then you have an SO3 order parameter, not an SO5 order parameter. Uh, and basically uh, you get the bottom two order parameters here, bottom three, this is two and one, you get these two. So this is why if you look at, I mean, Nagosa, Lee, and papers, and they have vortices with the D density wave in the center. So when you do the pi flux, uh, you get in addition, uh, uh, these two charge density wave. You don't get the charge density wave with the pi stagger flux. Also, we know now today that you know this pi flux, sorry, the staggered flux spin liquid is is basically unstable. This has become clear, especially work of uh, Ashwin Vishwanath and collaborators 
in the last few years, uh, where they confirmed a earlier calculation by Jason Alessia that there's a trivial monopole in the staggered flux phase. Uh, so this means that it almost certainly it's a confining phase. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the pi flux being SU2 gauge field has no monopoles. And, and I think there's a lot of evidence that pi flux is at least deconfined over much longer length scale. So, so today there's, you know, in fact, that was much of the part of the motivation for this work that we really should go back to the pi flux. The staggered flux uh, is not, uh, I believe, the right starting point. Uh, okay, uh, I can't see that. Oh, I see. Maybe, okay, Nadi, go ahead, speak up. <laughs> okay. 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 okay, thank you for the very interesting talk as I was sitting here trying to translate it to a language I can understand. It seems to me that in the end, you mentioned something that the gauge field is for the spin part on the last line. Did I hear that uh, correctly? That, yeah, but I didn't talk about that at all. Yeah, that's that really requires, okay, in short, that requires a further analysis where you go to a rotating reference frame and then introduce another gauge field. That's for the strange metal part. So all my discussion so far that in this talk was for the number gauge field, basically. No, I, I, un I understood that. I, I, my question was, that's a, that is an you can elaborate on this point. If it takes too, far, too long, maybe not, but I wanted to hear more about that. Uh, well, all I can say is that, you know, so if, if you go to this theory, uh, this ancilla theory here, uh, then to get the physical spectrum, you have to project these two ancillas onto their singlet state. So there's a constraint here that S1 plus S2 should be zero. Uh, and when you put that singlet construction, you get another SU2 gauge field. And that SU2 gauge field is what we believe is important for the strange metal, which, you know, so in terms of this phase diagram in the beginning, uh, or yeah, so I I just talked about here going down this way, but if you want to go across the strange metal of the Fermi liquid, then that's a different theory. Uh, so far, I just talked about this one, and here this this is the, just the you know the usual SU two gauge field, which in fact was pointed out by Affleck already in nineteen eighty nine or something, uh, and also Eduardo Fredkin. Uh, is the, that's the same SU2 gauge field here. But for this one, it's a different SU2 that actually we introduced much later. Okay. Yeah, the so, SU2 of spin, is, is it related in any way to rotations of space or not? No, spin orbit is zero in this theory. I see. But if you had spin orbit coupling, it would be rot uh, rotated. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, here I have a okay. question. Uh, I wonder whether uh, uh important assumption here is that even at a half feeling, U is not too big, so you have a charge fluctuation at low energy. I wonder uh, do you the charge fluctuation have an energy scale less than pseudo gap energy scale? No. So the whole discussion on half filling, you're correct about half filling. The whole discussion of half filling was just for you know illustrative purposes in a simple setting. Uh so if you want to actually get a D-wave superconductor at half filling, then yes, you have to have U small. On the other hand, I, if once you go to finite doping, I don't need that. The U is infinity practically, in, you know, uh, even in this ancilla model, U is very, very large. Uh, and, and we can implement that. We have all the IC2 gauge fields. It's all, the point really is that the advantage of the ancilla model uh, is that, you can separate all the subtleties associated with, you know, the spin liquid here from the charge motion and the Fermi surface formation. The Fermi surface formation happens in the condo lattice. The spin liquid just remains exactly as it is. It, it just simplifies, at least simplified our thinking enormously once you did it this way. Uh, but the, okay. my question is that because question you, okay, you may not like this way of doing it, but I will say that when in our final theory, for the finite doping, we do not need small U. No, absolutely not. Yeah. 
but uh, my question is that at half feeling, uh, you emphasize this SO5 or the parameter, seems which contains uh, CDW, that seems suggest they contain charge fluctuation. So that's my question, whether this, uh, uh, this uh, a particle symmetry for the boson is an assumption that uh, the U is small, so you have a significant charge fluctuation even at a half feeling. I don't believe so. I mean, uh, it's only the, no, I don't, yeah. I mean, if you have particle only symmetry of finite doping, you, you'll have the first order time derivative term for the boson. And that, yeah. that does make the SO5 symmetry. But it's, you know, it's probably but a SO5 smaller thing. I have a contained charge fluctuation. So the question that the, when, by considering SO5 at half filling, whether that is an assumption that the charge fluctuation actually are present at half filling. I, at half filling, I agree with you. To get SO5 symmetry at half filling, uh, you do need charge fluctuations. To, I mean, you need small U. But okay. I don't agree at finite domain. Okay. So the so the assumption is that the half filling. Okay. So you so the picture here is a half filling. You just uh, pretend the U is small to get some theory. Then you say actually this small U theory at half filling is more relevant at finite doping. Is that the idea? Uh, yes. I mean. This is the way I presented it. That's not the way we did the theory. The half filling was after the fact, just to give the talk. It was okay. <laughs> we weren't even thinking about it, but we started the work. <laughs> I see. Just for this Thank talk, you. I thought I'd illustrate the half filling case. Uh, maybe it was. Maybe I shouldn't have done it. I could have presented the whole talk without ever talking about half filling, which is yeah. how we did the work actually. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Now I understand. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so then. Uh, can I make my, my question now? I have one question. Uh, one second. Are there other people waiting? Yeah, Fabio. Okay, this is Fabio. Okay, go ahead, Fabio. Thank you, Sabri. Look, in, in your rich and complex phase diagram, you trace out a arrow C when you start with a hot spot and you end up with Fermi arcs, right? And you pass yeah. and, and, and you cross the strange metals. Usually, yes. uh, when you are dealing with strange, strange metals, we lose signs of the firm surface. So yes. my question is, uh, from the symmetrical point of view, how will we start with hot spots and you end up with firm arcs crossing the strange metals? Well, uh, at least at the level of means. So first of all, yeah. We, we end up in this theory, we also end up with certain ghost Fermi surfaces actually uh, of the second and cellular layer, which carry neither spin nor charge, uh, but they're very strongly coupled to an SC2 gauge field. So who knows whether they can be directly seen. Uh, but basically roughly, if you want a mean field theory, I mean, you, you can just uh, see it here. If you just, if you start with, uh, you know, this layer, the top layer, which has got a large Fermi surface, and this second layer of fermions, which we assume has a spin-on Fermi surface. This is exactly what you do in heavy fermion theory. And then you just turn on this hybridization, then you will get the Fermi arcs. I mean, that's what we did in this paper where we did all the numerical computations. That was the starting point. We put in some corrections and so on. But basically, in the paper when we computed the pseudo gap, we just ignored F, the bottom layer and just did a very conventional, actually we didn't quite ignore it. We did some perturbative calculation of JPEG. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we, we just did the usual Fermi surface hybridization. So, so the, the same physics that gives you the large Fermi surface in a condo lattice, for this Fermi surface topology will give you the Fermi arcs. That's what we claim. You know, so so the, you know that's my uh, commercial announcement for this. You know, the nice thing about this theory uh, is that it just combines two things we understand very well now. We understand very well the condo lattice heavy Fermi liquid. We understand spin liquids very well. Well, you just couple them together, you get the pseudo gap matter. <laughs> and these are phases of matter we know exist on their own now very well. So uh, might as well work with animals we know very well. Let's combine them. <laughs> okay. 
Right. Uh, thank you for this amazing talk and your dental attention too. Thank you very much, Tony. <laughs> yeah, Andre, you had a question? Yeah, I guess it's my turn now, yeah. So uh, my question again is very simple. So uh, it's referring to the discussions that you had with Greg about how to verify uh, the theory, et cetera. And yeah. it's more like a wish than a real question, but um, here's the story. Uh, as you well know, um, you can, let's try to compare this with much more simple story about pseudo gap due to thermal precursors, thermal um, antiferromagnetic fluctuations. Yeah. And in that case, you also have, of course, enhancement of spectral weight at the backside of the pocket. And because it's all thermal, thermal surface is not well defined, so you cannot really talk about uh, strict excitations at the thermal surface. But in that case, you can um, at least make one thing to uh, calculate what's the thermal evolution of the spectral function of the backside of the pocket. And I'm wondering whether something like this can be possible in your FL star case, just to see the difference and maybe to make some, some predictions that would be qualitatively different from uh, thermal precursors. Okay, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, we'll think about that. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I would say that the theory you're referring to requires long range order at low T, if I understand correctly, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but suppose you do it. experiment and you just don't know anything about long, what happens at low T. It's just a yeah. question about pseudo gap per se. Okay, well, that's a, that's a good challenge. We'll think about that. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so let's say at half filling, I was talking about system with small u, and I was just trying to do some symmetry analysis. I can see from the question that, that maybe that wasn't the best idea. <laughs> but at finite doping, I'm, I'm really talking about you know, a large u system, which is at finite doping. Now, what we know from the uh, large u system at finite doping is that the charge carriers are electrons, okay? So it's not a very, I mean, you could start with a theory, we take the electron and fractionalize it to a whole on and a spin on, and then you have to put it back together again. It, it just, that's a picture that people have talked about, but it's almost impossible to do any actual calculations with it <laughs> and it's confusing. So instead, uh, you know, I advocating this ancilla model uh, and the ancilla model, the, the boson, is just uh, a coupling of the spin liquid to the to the uh, to the electron-like carriers on the Fermi surface, uh, and in principle, this is all can be done uh, quantitatively if you, you know, had a big enough computer. The whole procedure is just perturbative, uh, and and the point is in the Ancilla model, you get these small pockets for free. It just comes right out. It's the starting point. You have the right quantum numbers of the, what's happening on the Fermi surface. In the usual approach of spin charge fractionization, which there are thousands of papers, that is not free. That requires a lot of work. Uh, here we get that free. So that's, it's really, a, in the end, we're talking about the same thing, but I claim this is a much cleaner way to do it. And because we were thinking this way that we came up with the theory, <laughs> it really made it, Many things simple, but were not obvious in the old world. Well, what we what we have, to, yeah, we start out with the paramagnon. The paramagnon is this object. So I could do all kinds of theory perturbation theory in lambda, and you know, Andre has many beautiful papers on that. Uh, but to any order in lambda, that kind of perturbation theory will not tell you that you could take these two, you could take the paramagnon and split it into two spinner halves. 
So I, I at some lattice level, I, I do something highly non-perturbative from the point of view of the uh, of the underlying uh, of the paramagnon theory. I take the spin one paramagnon and I fractionalize the paramagnon. So that's the key step. So I have to fractionalize the paramagnon, and then what's happening is that the boson B uh, is the overlap between half of the paramagnon and the electron. <laughs> That's what it is. That's, I think, the way to say it, the correct physical way to say it at large units. It's the, it's the composite of the electron and half a paramagnon, <laughs> rather than an electron which splits into a whole on and a spin off. I mean, the quantum numbers are the same, but the physical correct description, I would say, is that it's a composite of an electron and of half a paramagnon. Yeah, thank you.